Hi, I'm Pastor Jerry Gerardo with uh, Lighthouse Christian Church here in Novato, California. Hi, and this is Ed Mabry with faithbyreason.net. How are you doing, Jerry? Hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, Ed. Uh, you know, I, I know that you are too, which yeah. is great to hear. Uh, but gosh, you've just continued to make extraordinary progress with your research and uh, your, uh, you know, video episodes of Revelation Unveiled. Uh, we're up to episode 37. 37, yeah. 37, <laughs> wow. This is the 37th and more, many more to come. But yeah. uh, in 37, you're tackling the end of Revelation chapter 10 and then marching through chapter 11, yep. right? So I wanted to ask you first in chapter 10, uh, what we encounter is, um, you know, John, who's, who's supposed to and does consume a book. Yeah. He, he, I mean, this is extraordinary, right? Right. And so want to hear your take on that before we get into chapter 11. Sure. So thank you for that. So yeah, chapter 10 was, you know, it's pretty significant. We talked in the last episode, how I just, I can only get through half of episode uh, of, of chapter 10, because it was, it, it brought in so many things from the Old Testament, the, this trial that has been going on since Daniel chapter seven, where the nations and the angelic entities that were over the nations are, are were, were being were put on trial. And it's just a whole huge thing. And it concludes where with the angel who is actually, who is Jesus, a theophany a, in, in Christology, he's the an angel, the messenger who swears that there, there will be delay no longer in the judgment. And, and that's the first part of chapter 10. And of course, this angel, who again is, is Jesus, has this little book in his hand. And in the second part of chapter 10, uh, John is told to, to eat the little book, to eat this book. And that sounds odd, you know, eating books, you know, they're not generally uh, something on the, in the standard American, standard American diet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but, but here's the thing. so it's, it's an odd thing but whenever we come up with when we see something that's strange in the bible and we don't know what it means the best thing to do is let the bible try to interpret itself let's see where else we encounter this and there are a couple places in the old testament that i highlight in the uh, the video uh where uh, a man of god eats a book ezekiel chapter uh, it chapters two and three he uh ezekiel was, is given a book that had that's written um, on the inside and outside, which, hey, harkens back to the scroll we encounter in Revelation chapters four and five, which is the title lead to the earth. And on the back are lamentations and woes, and Ezekiel's told to eat it, and it's sweet in his mouth. We also see in Jeremiah, where he, where Jeremiah is, is, is talking in poetic language, saying, I ate your words, and, and you know, and, and I consumed them. And, I, and, they were, and they had the indignation or, or bitterness. And John is told the same thing. He said, eat this book and it'll be sweet in your mouth. It'll make your belly bitter. Obviously, we're talking you know, um, symbolically, what does this mean? Well, I, I believe that this little book, is so, a lot of people think that the book is the same scroll that Jesus had in chapter four and five. Could be. I, I think there's reason to believe it may not be because it's described differently. It's described as a little book and, you know, John didn't describe it as the same book. Doesn't mean it's not, but my opinion is that this is one of the books that were opened during the trial. And this has the verdict because again, a few chap a few verses earlier, Jesus says, judgment's done, there'll be delayed no longer. So it would seem he would have that verdict in his hand. And if John is eating that, it, it's sweet in his mouth because this is what, everyone's been waiting for. This is the culmination of the, the trial where the nations will go back into the possession of Jesus now. So that's sweet. But the bitterness is the way it's going to happen. There's going to be harsh, harsh judgment on the world. So that might be why there's that bitterness um, in his belly. And then he's told something very interesting, which we'll talk about on the, uh, after your next question. After he eats the book, he's told, you must prophesy again over many you know, nations and tongues and kings. So yeah, so that's that little strange episode. Wow. Yeah, no, no, really fascinating. And I appreciate you with all your research going back and pulling out other places in scripture where there's similar things going on in, with Ezekiel and Jeremiah. So, so well done with that. That actually is really helpful. Now we press on into chapter 11 yeah. and we encounter two incredible people seem like they're people who are witnesses of what's transpiring. So yeah, let's tackle that. <laughs> sure. So chapter we'll 11. Yeah. That. Yeah. 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 So, so ch chapter 11 is another very interesting chapter that again, it's, it's a parenthesis between the, you know, the sixth and seventh trumpet, which we'll get to, excuse me, chapter 11. So these are things that I think that are happening 
around the same time, or be a little before the Trumpist, but you know, that's how Revelation is, is kind of constructed with these little parenthetical areas. So John is, is told to do another strange task, which obviously in the Old Testament, a lot of prophets are, are ordered to do these things that symbolize what God wants us to, to understand or, 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 or what God is doing. He's told to measure the, 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 the temple, the outer court, I'm sorry, so he's told to measure the temple, but not to measure the outer court, because that's given over to the Gentiles for 42 months. That's three and a half years, and that should, you know, kind of perk you up, because you know that this time period, which we call the tribulation, is divided into two three and a half year periods, 42 months, 1260 days. So the Gentiles will have dominion over the temple mount for three and a half years, but they won't have the temple itself, because that's God's area. That's why I tend to believe that this is is the first three and a half years of this tribulation period. Could be wrong. Others think differently, and man, that's totally fine. But I think when when what when when we see what happens here, it's the first three and a half years. That that and and that could very well be because uh, in the outer court is where I believe the dome of the rock is, which is what a sacred place in in Islam. Um, it's not exactly on the Temple Mount, according to archaeologists. And I, when the Antichrist comes into play, we, we'll talk about him in a, in a couple episodes, he, he, he confirms this treaty for seven years. And I think part of that will have to be getting the temple rebuilt because it's not currently there and he's going to defile the temple. So the temple has to be rebuilt. How will that happen in, this, in the geopolitical atmosphere? Maybe there, the Dome of the Rock and the temple and maybe even a cathedral will be all be side by side, but everything else around the temple will be uh, uh, the Gentiles uh, area. And then he's, God says he's going to give power to his two witnesses to prophesy or to preach or to testify for three and a half years. And again, I think it's the first three and a half years, because at the end of the three and a half years, we'll see that the Antichrist is going to you know, do something pretty bad to them and, and basically kill them. So these two witnesses, what, what's their mission before we talk about their identity? Well, it says they're witnesses. And of course, in our vernacular, when we think of witnesses, we think of someone evangelizing. And that's not to say they won't. Um, yeah. cause people to come to Christ, because I think they're going to be doing this, this preaching for three and a half years. But keep in mind, we just talked about a trial, and we also have witnesses in a trial, and they are testifying to what I think, I believe they're testifying to God's plan, God's plan of judgment that's upcoming, just like when Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, which he didn't want to do until, you know, God got a great fish to help him understand a little bit better what God's plan was. Jonah's uh, a testimony to Nineveh was not some seeker sensitive market research message. It was, hey, 40 days no. destruction. You're 40 days and you're done. It wasn't right. Jesus loves you, come to Christ. It was like, nope, you guys are done in 40 days. I think these two witnesses will be doing something very similar, saying that three and a half years, then destruction's coming. Yeah. And they will cause plagues to happen anytime they want. When someone tries to harm them for, for saying this message that people won't like, fire will come out of their mouth and consume people. They'll shut up the heaven so it won't rain. And, and I don't know if that's a local thing or a worldwide thing. Either way, it's going to be tough. I think it's worldwide because it says the whole world is going to hate these guys. Imagine it not raining for three and a half years. Here in Northern California, we have one bad non-rainy season and we're in a drought. Yeah. And you know they'll be able to turn the waters to blood. So they're really going to be a, a scourge to the earth the whole world is going to see these guys on CNN or Fox News or whatever, um, the, who are just saying these, these uh, judgments against the world and causing all these terrible things to happen. Terrible from the world standpoint. So the question is, who are these guys? There's some debate over, you know, uh, um, uh, who they might be because the Bible doesn't specifically name them, but it's, it, God calls them an olive tree and a lampstand before him. So, one of them is is pretty generally uh, recognized and understood to be the prophet Elijah because for a couple of reasons Elijah is promised by God to come back and prophesy again before the before the day of the Lord, and also uh, Elijah never died; he was raptured to heaven in a fiery chariot. Also, Elijah in his ministry caused the rain not to fall. So there's a lot of consensus on that. The second one, this people kind of divided up between either Moses or Elijah. Moses because Moses was, you know, through God uh, uh, caused plagues to come on the earth. And also um, this belief that Moses has some type of, 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 of career that, that, that's going to happen again later. He has another role because in the book of Jude, we see that Michael, the archangel, was fighting with Satan over, the, over Moses' body. Is there something about Moses' body that's significant? Um, another is, is Enoch. And Enoch, why? Because like 
Elijah, he was never died. He never died. He was raptured in Genesis chapter five. He was caught up to heaven to, with God. And also in the pseudo, uh, pseudepigraphal book of Enoch, he is he proclaims judgment against the fallen angels. And that's something that um, I believe that uh, will be happening again. He'll be pronouncing judgment. And there's another possibility that it could that this other one could be the apostle John. Why? Because as we just talked about, he was told he would have to prophesy again to many nations and tongues and kings. And, and, and he could represent the, the lampstand, which is the church. We see that in, in Revelation chapter one. And the olive tree is an idiom for Israel. So if you have Elijah and John, the, and, and, mm -hmm. and John the apostle, you have a representative of Israel, representative of the church. So where do I, um, where, where do I uh, well, um, come out with this? I, I tend to think it's maybe uh, Elijah and Enoch, but I could, you know, sometimes I think it's Elijah and Moses. It doesn't really matter. Honestly, this is not something I'm, I, I'm going to like dispute people about because I think their identity is far less important than their message and, and, and what they are here to do. Their mission is more important than their identity. So what happens to these guys? Eventually, after their testimony is over and not before because they will be protected, once they are done with God's work, then the Antichrist is going to kill them. And the world is going to be so happy about this and such and it's such a depraved state, they're going to let their bodies just rot in the street for three days. They won't even let them be buried. They're going to have parties and be and giving gifts. It's going to be like Christmas when because of these two prophets who are tormented them are, are, are finally gone and they're just going to let their bodies rot in the street. However, after three and a half days, God is going to resurrect them and the whole world will see it and they're going to rise and, and be ascended and, and God says, come up here which is the same uh, thing he said in Revelation chapter four, which many see as possibly a, a rapture event. So this is where I believe a, the mid-tribulation rapture happens because I, 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 as you know from my, um, my thoughts is that there are three raptures. There's the pre-tribulation rapture for the believing church, the mid-tribulation rapture for tribulation saints. And I believe the last uh, the post-tribulation rapture is, is mostly is, is for unbelieving Israel, but we, I talked about that before. I'm not going to get into detail, but I believe this is where it happens, where the two witnesses, the 144,000, and any remaining Christians at this point are caught up to be with God. And after this, I would argue that there probably aren't any Christians left. Everyone left at this point have ta has taken a mark. It's someone, people who have taken the mark of the beast or unbelieving Israel who have not taken the mark, but also aren't quite ready to believe in Jesus and they're yeah. caught up in heaven. And then, then the seventh trumpet sounds. And what happens is that the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our Lord. So remember the seven trumpets, the whole point of those, in my opinion, is breaking down the satanic stronghold. So Jesus can proclaim, can claim the earth. And here's where it happens. The seventh trumpet blows it. And it says the kingdoms are now all uh, belong to Jesus. And this is called the third woe. Why? Because these seven trumpets usher in the final judgment. And then the last thing, which is really amazing, it says the temple of God, he, John saw the temple of God open in heaven and the ark. Why is it open now? Because everyone has access to it. All Christians now are in the world. Oh, oh sorry, my dog's barking. So give me a second. Right. Yeah, you know where you're at. Yeah, sorry about that. Had to had to deal with the with, with, with the pup. So I think I was saying the temple is, is open and, and is accessible now. Why? Because I think the temple is 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 being defiled by the Antichrist, who we'll talk about down the road. So I think this is another reason why this is happening um, at the first three and a half years. And that he no longer needs a temple on earth because now the temple in heaven is open. And the temple on earth is just a replica, a representation of the temple of God. The Ark of the Covenant is a rep is a replica of the true Ark of the Covenant, which is the, the seat of God's throne in heaven. So that's that's and that's how it ends. And yeah, that, yeah. Again, yeah. incredible imagery. These two witnesses. Yeah, great explanations. It is interesting to ponder. Yeah, their specific identity. You know, uh, Do you have an opinion of Moses, who? Enoch, even potentially Apostle John, or or maybe it's someone else, but. Yeah. So, uh, so I have, to ask, I have to ask Jerry, would you have an opinion on who they might be? Well, again, with, with my studies over the years, I've been inclined to believe it's, it's, it's more likely Elijah and Enoch, right? Okay. Because, again, both were translated into heaven, and there's other compelling reasons to believe that. 
I get the thinking behind Moses as well. Mm -hmm. I actually get, although I hadn't really considered it before, even the thoughts about John or someone else from the church age, because you've got, you know, uh, the olive trees and you have the lampstand. Right. So again, throughout Revelation, it seems like God is still tying together all of history and, and his kingdom and his people from Old Testament times to New Testament times. And those who are in the kingdom, who are part of, of Christ, you know, are going to be there and are going to be there to worship and to celebrate him. We know that, yeah. but even in specific roles. So there's something even a little bit, I, I don't know, that, that's representative that relates to Israel and the church if you have somebody who's from the early church age, one of the apostles. So that's, that's fascinating to me. I really hadn't pondered that too much before, but as you said, these are interesting things to consider. We might be surprised. We probably will be surprised when those personalities are actually revealed, but what's clear is their mission. I really appreciate you focusing on their mission and um, you know, you're following kind of your train of thought here with the, the trial of the ages, and then there's a verdict. And now it's almost like you got people there to, to, to express to the world who are appointed by God uh, and anointed to get the message out about this verdict and about the sentence, in a sense, and the wrath that's coming. Well, God and, the always, world, and the world hates that because the world at that time is not following after Christ as we understand it in the right. in the least. It's the opposite. But God always warns. I mean, that's that's why he's just because yeah. he, he warns, just like he did with Jonah and Nineveh. Nineveh was, right. was, was doomed to destruction, but you know, Jonah went there for 40 to preach 40 days. He's given yeah. you a time. And what happened? Nineveh repented. Right. So God right, always, right, right. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, God it, always it's gives remarkable. People, it, it, you know, Jonah, Jonah went there, we know, and he didn't have a heart after the people in Nineveh at the least. It was the opposite. He wanted them to perish. You know, curse, curses on them. And God says, no, bring the message. And, and so he brought the message. He was faithful, finally, finally, finally to do it. And out of that, God brought about a redemption of sorts with Nineveh. And Jonah was even displeased with that. So I don't know these two witnesses. I've got to believe they might have a different take and maturity than, but they are bringing this announcement. And I've always looked at them as evangelists. So it's interesting your take on it because there clearly is evangelism that takes place when you announce this message and then some do come to Christ. In fact, many, and especially those that are Jewish. And so again, it's, it, you know, the fact that maybe both of these are, you know, from Old Testament times, Israel, that even the Jews would recognize, maybe that is God's plan. But it's, it's, it's fascinating to ponder. And all of these things are taking place, not in a corner, but on full display for the whole earth. Right. It's incredible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if, so people will have no excuse. They, no. They, they will have these guys preaching to them for three and a half years. So, right, yeah. right. So, God can justly bring about his judgment because every, people have gotten every possible opportunity. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And I'm, you know, it's fascinating to me. I, I wrestled uh, in high school for a year and what a great sport and, you know, a mano a mano kind of thing. And you'd see somebody and you'd be at the end of a match and somebody's winning. And then literally in the last second, there's just dramatic reversal. And I see these witnesses you know, wreaking havoc in a sense with those that are coming against God and what they're, what they're announcing. And then they're killed. What? They're killed. Yeah. The good guys are killed. And then there's the dramatic turnaround with their resurrection and what that might mean relative, not just to them, but everything else going on, like a, a mid you know, trib rapture kind of thing that, yeah. that you believe. So for me, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, it's all worthy of study. That's why we're going through this, Ed, and I really appreciate you doing this. At the same time, I'm just fascinated, and I want to keep studying. I'm personally, like you, I'm not caught up, and it has to be like this, or it has to be like that. It's going to be the way the Lord intends for it to be, but he's given us a lot of information to help us understand and process. 
And to your credit, you're digging into this a lot more than most everybody else I know. So, <laughs> so good work, good work. Um, so what's what's coming next now? So did we get through chapter 11? We did, did we got that? through chapter 11. We actually okay. absolutely did. Yeah, so, yeah. so next is obviously yeah, chapter 12. We're gonna get through all of chapter 12. And chapter 12 is this, is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible for a couple of reasons. One is that this vision, and it, it is a vision, so it's not literal. Right. Yeah, it yeah. is a vision of basically all of history up until the until the point of the Antichrist come, um, uh, you know, becoming yeah. incarnate, uh, or, or 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 indwelt rather. He's not incarnate. Yeah. He's indwelt. Yeah. And I love it because it's just this beautiful encapsulation, and it also shows, it gives us a glimpse into how God sees eternity, right. how God sees time and eternity. He sees everything happening at once. So you have this vision of all these things happening from Israel all the way to the tribulation in just a few sentences, but it's eternal. It's God sees everything unfolding at the same time because he's not bound by linear time the way we are. So it gives, and it's tough for us to kind of fully grasp that because with us, everything one, two, three, four, with God, it's like, it's all happening and it's a story. And that's what makes it, and stories are timeless, stories are eternal. And I think that God sees things in stories the same way that we can experience this. So we're going to talk about that in detail, talk about specifically who these characters are, the woman clothed in the sun, the dragon is pretty obvious, the man child, and, and all these in the, in the angels, uh, the fall of, of, of Satan's angels and this war in heaven. All these things are happening at the same time. It's a spectacular vision. But what I think God is really doing here is saying, this is everything. And he's going to show it to us. And it's, it's extraordinary. And I just, I, I, I love this chapter. So I'm looking forward to going over it next time. Well, that's great. Love that. And you've been enthusiastic about this whole thing and throwing yeah. yourself at it with a lot of study, research, and passion. So really looking forward to that next episode. I want to remind people again, people who are viewing this are probably already looking at it on YouTube, subscribe yeah. to Ed's YouTube channel, Faith by Reason faith by reason and click like when you're reviewing these videos because it's a neat thing and it and it encourages others then to take a look so it expands maybe the impact of all this great research and gets other people connected and involved in studying scripture in this end time season and in the book of revelation along with ed series so also click uh, the bell for notifications so you know each posting that comes out, you'll be right there to stay on track. Also, go to Ed's website, www.faithbyreason.net. A lot of other great studies, great podcasts, great resources, and also ways to reach out to Ed and you know contact him, you know, start a dialogue. He's happy to do that. So brother, thanks for your continuing great research and work. Wish you the best this week. We're looking forward to uh, episode 38. Yeah. Or 38? Yeah. Chapter, yeah. chapter 12 next, next week. God bless you. You too. Talk to you later.